Hello, today is January 22nd, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Donald Paul Olton. Welcome, Don. Thank you for having me. Well, we'd like to ask you a few personal questions before we get into the questions about your service career. May I ask you when you were born? Yes, 22 July, 1930. And where were you born? Kingston, New York. And your current address? In Natick. How long have you lived in Natick? Uh, about 49 years. Have you seen a lot of changes in the town since you moved in 49 years ago? Oh, yes. And, and the changes I've seen uh, are all for the better. For example, I think we have one of the best uh, designed and functional downtown areas of any of the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts. So I'm very pro natic I guess. That's good to hear. <laughs> and what is your marital status? Uh, I'm married, and uh, we have uh, four children. And do you have any grandchildren? Uh, yes, I have six grandchildren. And how long have you been married? Uh, it will be 50 years in uh, April of this year. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank That's you. quite a feat. Where and when did you enter the military? Uh, I entered uh, uh, technically, I guess, uh, in Albany, New York. Uh, um, but I was drafted from Kingston, New York. And what year was that? Uh, that would be 1951. And you were drafted because? Well, uh, well the, there was the uh, Korean War. What were you hearing on. about the Korean War at that time? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, I didn't pay much attention to it. My uh, personal plan at the time was to become a golf pro. I. Uh, started to caddy when I was nine, and uh, I had a one handicap for six or eight years, and uh, uh, I had a job lined up in Hollywood, Florida as a teaching pro, and I was 21 years old, and uh, my job was to start on uh, November 15th of 1951, but I was drafted September 4th of that year. Was that unexpected, or had you heard of other friends or acquaintances also getting drafted? Well, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, several friends were drafted ahead of me, and uh, so I was aware of the draft. But to tell you the truth, I was in my own world and uh, sort of totally ignored what was going on. So to be drafted came as something of a shock, to be frank. And once you were drafted, what branch did you join? Uh, I was uh, uh, sent to the uh, infantry. Army? Yeah, Army Infantry, correct. And did you have a choice? No. How old were you then, 21? 21 when I was drafted, yes. So prior to 21, were you working as a golf semi-pro or? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, I started when I was caddying when I was nine. And uh, so in addition to caddying right up until I was 21, uh, I uh, also uh, attended bar at the uh, uh, country club functions. And so uh, 
it was an intriguing time for me. So would you say you were a bit stunned that you were drafted? Well, uh, qualified, yes, I was. Uh, I was happy at what I was doing. I was looking forward to uh, going to Florida, where I had, I had never been. As a matter of fact, uh, my father used to say, you've never been out of sight. <laughs> and indeed, I had not been. So instead of going to Florida, where, did, where were you sent for basic training? I went to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. And uh, I took 16 weeks of uh, basic uh, training, infantry training, uh, which I found out later was excellent. It really was very thorough. And, and uh, they taught us all to be very self-sufficient under most circumstances. Now you say you found out later. At the time, did you feel that it was very difficult, or what was it like? Well, I think physically I was in great shape. I uh, attribute that to my golf, largely, and to the caddying and so on. So I had little trouble, uh, none to speak of, in terms of performing all the duties that they wanted us to do the training, the running, the uh, uh, bivouacs, uh, sleeping out overnight on the ground and so on. Uh, I can honestly say none of that uh, bothered me. I, I was from a family of uh, 10 children and uh, I was used to eating with large groups, shall we say. and. Uh, so consequently, eating uh, in the combined uh, mess halls that they had at Fort Dix was not too much of a cultural shock for me. The, the most difficult for me, I think, was the uh, lack of privacy uh, relative to the bathroom and, uh, and anything else, as a matter of fact. Even uh, getting mail, you would be inclined to have someone looking over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that uh, made me uncomfortable. While you were in those 16 weeks of basic training, did you receive, or during or shortly thereafter, did you receive any advanced or specialized training beyond basic? No. And. What was your first duty station? Uh, it was uh, the Chorwan Valley of uh, Korea. A and how do you spell that? C-H-O-R-W-O-N. So from basic, you knew you were going right to Korea? Uh, we knew it uh, probably uh, around the 12th week became pretty apparent that uh, almost all of my training company was going to Korea. So did you go over as a unit? Uh, not as a unit, but as individuals. Uh, we were on the uh, ship, the uh, USS General Butner, a troop ship. And ultimately, we picked up a battalion of troops in uh, Hawaii on the way to, uh, to Japan. And uh, we also picked up a battalion of Colombians at the same time, because Korea, as you well know, was a United Nations effort. I will have more to say on that a little later. You went by troop ship. You were excited initially about going to Florida, never having been out of sight, as you said. What were That's your feelings about going overseas, even going to Hawaii, Japan, and then Korea? Well, uh, it, it was somewhat unreal for me.
to be doing that kind of traveling. Uh, we, I was born in 1930, which was the height of the Depression, and uh, we were relatively poor with 10 children, and consequently, we never stayed over at anyone's house. Uh, I had never been to New York City, for example, uh, before I went into the Army. But uh, the Army uh, teaches you to sort of take it as it comes, one day at a time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a lot of uh, horseplay for diversion. And uh, uh, I and uh, there was a fellow in the barracks that, play, that played the guitar. And they used to have what they called uh, parties. Uh, actually, they weren't parties. They were cleanup parties where you had to sweep and mop the, the thing and so on. But this fellow would get up on a bed and play the guitar, and he was marvelous, and, uh, uh, and sing. And I would sing with him. Uh, my three brothers and I uh, had a quartet uh, in, back in Kingston, and uh, we used to go out on Saturday nights with my father, who taught us how to sing barbershop harmony. And uh, we would go to what they called uh, uh, today, they'd call them nightclubs. Mm -hmm. But uh, in those days, they were called saloons, and they were. <laughs> the whole place was rocking, so, so to speak. But anyway, uh, when we performed, they would then throw money, and we would pick it up off the floor. This is in the saloons? Yes, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it was all coins. And some nights we'd pick up 20 or 22 dollars in that area, that neighborhood. And uh, however, in those days, uh, that was a terrific amount of money. And my father was out of work as a ship's carpenter at the time, much of the time. So in a sense, we, we sort of uh, kept the family going. Well, when I met this guy in, in, uh, in, the, ba in the barracks, uh, and he and I used to sing, we called it GI parties. And when the sergeant would leave, Pat was the fellow's name, would jump up on the bed and say, let's go, Walton. And we'd, we'd sing songs while everybody else in the place worked. <laughs> so, so you... You, you not only enjoyed something you were doing singing, but you got out of working and probably exactly the others didn't mind because they oh, were enjoying no, they, it. They were happy mm -hmm. with uh, what we were doing. When you reached Chorwan Valley, well, talk about when, where did you land on the troop ship? In Japan initially? Yes, yes. As Tell a us about fact. what oh, you did then when you landed all right. in Japan. Uh, we landed at Yokohama. Uh, which uh, I believe uh, on the limits of Yokohama are about six miles from Tokyo. And uh, we went from Yokohama to a place called Camp Drake. And Camp Drake was uh, really a replacement depot. And did you understand the term replacement? Yes, yes I did. And, and in fact, uh, we shortened it and called it a REPL depot. Uh, that's the Army terms. And uh, we were there about four or five days, and they processed us. And by that I mean they uh, gave us uh, several sets of fatigue uniforms. They uh, issued us <laughs> rifles and uh, basic loads of ammunition. Uh, so we were armed uh, by the time we ultimately took a train uh, from uh, 
Camp Drake or Yokohama. Well, uh, I suppose technically it was Tokyo where we got on the train. And we went south to Sasebo, Japan, which is just about the southernmost tip of uh, Japan. And uh, at Sasebo, uh, we boarded a, what they called an overnight ferry. And uh, that ferry took us to Pusan in uh, Korea. Well, uh, we stayed in a REPL depot at Pusan. We were sort of quarantined. They even had barbed wire fence around where we were assigned at that time. What was the weather like there at that time? Uh, when we landed, it, it was, uh, well, let me think now. That was, uh, uh, see, I'm a little confused on the dates. Let me give that some thought, okay. and I'll get back to it. But uh, anyway, we uh, went from uh, Pusan by train, which w was, they told us, really converted cattle cars, uh, wooden frame and uh, wooden hard benches and so on. Very uncomfortable. But uh, so we went north uh, up to a place called Chorwon. That's C-H-O-R-W-O-N, Chorwon. And that uh, was another REPL depot, and uh, it's where all of us were split up. Uh, I'm talking now about my basic training friends, and uh, we were sent to different uh, divisions. Now, in my case, a, a uh, master sergeant came in, into the area where we were staying and he sort of looked us over like we were, he was buying uh, cattle. <laughs> and uh, at some point he approached me and said, uh, uh, what are your plans? What are you going to do now? And I said, well, you know, we're all riflemen in the infantry, so uh, I'm going to try and make the best of it. And he said, well, how would you like to join me? in my outfit. And he said, it's all volunteer. You don't have to do it. I said, what is it? He said, I'd like you to become an intelligence and reconnaissance scout. It's a very fancy title, which uh, on the Hill, they reduced it to INR. And uh, that's what I was known as, INR, later on. Did you know at the time when he mentioned it what it would mean? Not really. Uh, he was in a great hurry at the time he talked to me, and he kept it very short, and uh, he disappeared within minutes from the time I said yes. And also uh, a, a friend of mine from uh, basic training uh, said, well, where are you going, Don? And I, told, I said, well, I'm going up to the 7th Infantry Division. Uh, and this uh, sergeant asked me to be in his uh, uh, section uh, called the INR. And this friend said, well, I'd like to go with you. And I said, well, why don't we play it that way? And so we did. Uh, we stayed close together. And when the uh, uh, word came, it's time to move or time to go, uh, he stayed right with me. Are you at liberty to say what his name is? I, I really don't feel comfortable naming him for reasons I could get to later. Sure. Uh, he, uh, and I don't have his permission to use his name. You'll notice in my journal I was very careful about that uh, and so on. But uh, anyway, uh, so we went 
up to the uh, seventh division in the Churwan Valley. And at the time, uh, in Korea, there was a lot of talk, and I guess even back in the States, that we uh, were not to go beyond the 38th parallel, uh, which at its lowest point, I think, runs right near Seoul, maybe right through Seoul. But uh, so in the, in the process, we went up through Seoul. And while there, there had been some very fierce battles at Seoul before we got there. And how did you hear about those? Uh, well, uh, first of all, you'd look at all the buildings in Seoul, and I didn't see a one that didn't have shell holes all over it. And so everybody in the, uh, uh, in the group was talking about what the battles were and, and how intense they must have been and so on. Uh, Did so you get any kind of news from any... USO or any Army news no. bulletins? No. We had, we had some briefings uh, in uh, Japan, in Camp Drake, that I mentioned earlier. And uh, those briefings, for example, talked about the fact that uh, the Koreans used uh, human waste on their rice patties uh, for fertilizer and that as a consequence, uh, you could smell Pusan, they said 10 miles out in the bay. Well, they were wrong. It's more like 30 miles out. The odor was just tremendous. It turns out, though, that about three days after being there, I never noticed it again. You got used to it. I just adapted, I guess. Once you were in Churwan Valley, what was your day like in the beginning? All right. Uh, when I got to uh, uh, the 7th uh, Division, where, where they were located, which incidentally was about 92 miles above the 38th parallel, uh, we were in Pyongyang Province, which uh, is the capital of North Korea. And uh, however, where we were was, was called the main line of resistance. And we called it the MLR. And so where we were uh, then, uh, we uh, uh, had an outpost. We had actually two outposts on the battalion front. and. Uh, there were ridges that ran from the MLR out to the outpost. And so I was assigned to the outpost uh, as a, a uh, observer, as a, a scout for the uh, uh, intelligence section. Uh, technically, it was called S2. Uh, and I guess to this day they still call the intelligence S2. And uh, so have I answered the... Yet how far away was your outpost from the rest of your troops? Uh, we were a mile and a half out in front of the line. When you say we, how how large was the Talk, tell us what oh, the outpost right. was like and who right. was there. The outpost was a platoon-sized <coughs> platoon uh, outpost, uh, which is, at that time, I don't know how they're structured today, but at that time, that was approximately 48 men at any given time. Uh, however, it varied. Sometimes, uh, uh, now in the case of uh, my assignment, I was assigned to a headquarters company of the uh, uh, 3rd Battalion of the 7th Infantry Division. And uh, uh, 
So in that uh, capacity, uh, they, uh, the, I stayed on the outpost, and they assigned uh, different platoons to come out to the outpost uh, every week. It was a different infantry platoon from uh, the battalion. And, and uh, in any case, uh, I stayed uh, on the outpost four and a half months. And uh, two of those months, they sent out, uh, they sent out different platoons every week. I asked a captain uh, who came out with his troops and stayed the week, and I asked him why they rotated them every week. And he said, it's simple. They all get trigger happy at the end of a week. So I was sort of impervious to that, I guess. It didn't bother me. Uh, they left, a new platoon came. When they left, where did they go? Uh, well, they went back to the front line. Mm -hmm. And then they were dispersed along the, the MLR that I spoke of. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, after two months, they sent up a, a United Nations force that was the Ethiopians. And so I spent two and a half months on the outpost with the Ethiopians. Now, the interesting thing about that was that I had become, uh, if, when the Ethiopians arrived, I had become, in addition to my intelligence reporting observations of the enemy and estimates of size and so on, uh, daily I had to report, but we had no one with the ability to do counterfire. So one of the sergeants from the rear called me. We had sound power telephones and uh, we also had radios. The radio was a so-called PRC-10 radio, not very powerful. And in that terrain, with the uh, mountainous uh, ridges and valleys and fingers of the, of the hills, uh, there, were, there were places where the PRC-10 didn't work at all. But in any case, the Ethiopians came out, and the only ones who could speak English of the Ethiopians was the uh, lieutenant or captain, as the case might be, uh, in charge of that particular pl platoon. On the very first day that the Ethiopians came, the lieutenant called me in and introduced himself and asked about me and my background and what was my function. And at this point, what was your rank? Uh, I was uh, Private E1. Uh, and in any case, uh, which, which is really the lowest designation you can have in, in the Army, but I was that new. And uh, they made me eventually a private E2, and in seven months I became a staff sergeant, uh, having been corporal for a time. And, uh, I, uh, when we got back to the rear, the battalion intelligence sergeant, who was a master sergeant, he rotated, and so they appointed me battalion intelligence sergeant. And in that capacity, I used to uh, make up patrol plans uh, for different patrols, and I went on many of the patrols. So were you in direct combat? Oh, yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, when I was on the outpost and with the, and Americans, uh, a sergeant from the rear 
came up and he wanted to uh, uh, see what combat was really like. And so he came to the outpost and he joined me for the day on the point. We were the forwardmost uh, uh, bunker, if you will, uh, on the hill. And uh, we were standing there and he was looking with his field glasses and, and uh, he said, show me a Chinese, because that's who we faced. We faced the 15th CCF, Chinese Communist Forces. Uh, and, and so I showed him uh, on our BC scope, uh, I showed him sitting Chinese, observing us and calling in fire upon us and so on. And uh, while we were in the process of, of his looking things over, there was a tremendous crack and the only other place I had ever heard that was when you're pulling targets and you're down in the pit uh, in the infantry and they, they're all back on the firing line and you're down in the pit and you can always tell when your target is fired on because of that crack. There's no, no mistaking it. And so uh, and this sergeant said, uh, what the hell was that? And I said, you've just been sniped at. And he said, oh, no, not uh, I don't know if he had ever pulled targets or had any sense, but in that closed environment, uh, it was the clear crack of a bullet. And uh, so I said, uh, we'll see about that. And there was a log behind us. And so I turned with my bayonet and I dug out the slug and gave it to him. It had gone right between us, just missed each one of us. And so that was a close call, but I gave him that, that uh, bullet and he uh, left. I encouraged him to get off the uh, hill, uh, off the outpost before dark, uh, enemy probes, uh, enemy, uh, uh, you know, coming up and, and trying to knock us off the hill. They did that almost every night. I had uh, nights when I threw, literally threw, boxes of grenades. They came in boxes, my memory says, uh, about nine to a box. There may have been a dozen in some of the larger boxes. And I had nights when I w had thrown uh, more than a dozen hand grenades. Uh, but mostly my uh, value to the Army, I think, was that they had asked me before I became an FO, forward, an FO, obser forward observer, forward observer okay. uh, and, and assigned me the duty to do all the counterfire for the outpost. That paid off when I was with the Ethiopians because I was the only one had access to counterfire. Well, uh, and that consisted of, uh, uh, we had 60 mortars, uh, 60 millimeter mortars in our uh, uh, various squads uh, that would come up. But we had, I had access to uh, 88 mortars, 88 millimeters. Everything I'm talking is in millimeters. So it was the 88 millimeters, the uh, 105 millimeters, the long toms, they and call them. What are long toms? Long toms are artillery fire. I don't know the millimeter size, but they had a range of more than 20 miles. They were huge. Uh, and uh, I also, could uh, call in sorties of jets. And a sortie is simply uh, an airplane uh, uh, section that is assigned a duty to uh, seek out targets. And they frankly appreciated when they got a call 
for even from me on the outpost. So would you call them and give coordinates and then yes, they would, would come out? And I, how many planes would come out at a time? Oh, two, maybe three. Do you and, feel it was effective? Oh, yes, they were, they were wonderful. Uh, they carried 500-pound uh, bombs and uh, uh, napalm as well. And when they dropped them, for example, on a hill in front of us, enemy hill, called Star Hill. And the reason they called it Star was because it had a center piece on the top, so to speak, and then it had fingers running in every direction uh, off the center of the hill. And that's why they called it Star Hill. Now, when you but, say they, is this something the Army called it or even the people in the area? Uh, no, no, the Army. Army these are, these are all American Hill. terms. And in fact, uh, different uh, battalions would name the hills different names. Now, sometimes they did that for security reasons, and that made sense. But uh, uh, we had a hill, for example, uh, at Triangle Hill. Uh, there were hills like uh, Sniper's Ridge was one. Uh, the other was called Jane Russell. Uh, and you might guess why. It had Twin Peaks. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was Jane Russell. So you called uh, it Jane Russell Hill or just Jane uh, Russell? It just, uh, well, it was, yeah, Jane Russell Hill or, or Hill Jane Russell, one or the other. When you talk about the hills, what was the terrain like? Well, uh, in the in Chorwan, it's the Chorwan Valley, and it's uh, except for these uh, uh, protruding ridges that I spoke of, uh, it was flat land, and it was almost uh, uh, the outpost. For example, was roughly. Uh, uh, oh, uh, I want to say 100 meters high uh, from the valley floor. And the valley floor consisted of abandoned, uh, it was no man's land technically, and it was abandoned rice paddies, for example. Uh, when we couldn't get water uh, brought out to us, because the so-called chogi trains, that's a, a term, C-H-O-G-I-E, chogi trains, uh, it came out. They consisted of 10 to 12 uh, Korean service corps uh, people, and those uh, people would come out with these packs, uh, pack boards on their back and carry five-gallon cans of water, uh, boxes of sea rations. Everything we ate was sea rations at that time on the hill. And uh, so the Chogi trains uh, got uh, pretty well shot up uh, on a certain day. When you With, go back to when you had mentioned earlier, <coughs> excuse me, that you had been four and a half Months. months as the forward observer and then later on in your conversation you mentioned Triangle Hill. Yes. Talk about All right. that battle. Where, okay, where we were, let me, let me talk about the uh, division front, uh, 7th division front. It, on the extreme west was Chorwan and it was part of the MLR. In theory, you could walk all the way across Korea in the trenches on the main line of resistance, but our piece of it was Chorwan on the west and Kumwa on the right. And Kumwa, uh, and I can spell that if you wish, uh, K-U-M-H-W-A. Kumwa. Uh, Kumwa faced a hill 598. That's meters high. Hill 598 became Triangle Hill. And the reason that was so, I was told, 
they considered uh, uh, Kumwa as one of the points of the Iron Triangle, so that uh, that's where it got its uh, name, Triangle Hill. But I knew because I had the maps, and that's why I know those regions so well. And back in the rear, for example, we even uh, made a sand table of our battalion front. And, and when uh, you say a sand table, would that be a mock-up yes. of what the real hill in exactly. the area would be like? But it was made out of sand, and uh, uh, you could kneel down. It was like a big sandbox. And you could kneel down and look at the various hills. One of them we call Papasan. Uh, it was 1,052 meters high, and the Chinese held that hill. And that meant that they were looking down on us uh, every day, 24 hours a day. They had the high ground. And uh, when you, uh, I had an order uh, on me that said, you will get a shower uh, in the rear. Uh, every three weeks and consequently that's the only time I could brush my teeth because on the outpost we never had enough water uh, we had water from rain and so on but I wouldn't use that and uh, I did use that to shave uh, and uh, we had the uh, monsoons uh, and it rained for 90 days and nights during the monsoons. And during that time, I slept every night in uh, my bunker in about five inches of water. And uh, it was so cold at night in that water that you'd have to lie still and uh, sort of heat the water up with your body temperature, and then you could doze off. Uh, so that was quite an experience. Um, was there... Um, one night, if I may just continue that thought, one night uh, we had rats, of course, all over the hill. In part, it was our fault because every time we ate uh, from a sea ration can, we threw it in front of our position. and. Uh, the science behind that was that how could they sneak up on you if they rattled those cans? And that became the basis on which you were smart enough to throw a grenade or whatever, fire your rifle if need be. One day when the Air Force sorties attacked Star Hill, this is shortly after I got up there on the hill, on the outpost, uh, they used napalm, and so the Chinese came out uh, from their positions running toward us, and it was the first time that we engaged the enemy face to face with our rifles and fired rifles and what have you. I, I, I talked about the Army training, and let me just develop that a bit. I was a, a real country boy, and I had never seen a weapon in my life. And it turns out that they trained me, and I was an expert shot. Uh, when I was in Japan, when they gave us our, our rifles, I, they sent us to the firing range, and I hit the bullseye on every shot. They thought it was the cadre, or the trainers, firing. And it was me. And I had uh, great confidence as a result uh, when I was on patrol uh, and so on. But, and uh, if I might, when you mention having the Chinese running at you, coming yes. on, how close were they to you? Well, uh, Star Hill from the point uh, was probably, oh, 300 meters. And when they ran toward us, they got within 100 meters of us. And there were occasions where they 
came right over the outpost. And, uh, and you fired at them and, and so on. They kept running, they'd go up, right up, up over to, uh, they were trying to get to the command post, uh, which was the center of the hill, and they knew that. So the other, uh, during your combat experience, and, and particularly this type of situation, Mm -hmm. Were there a lot of army casualties at that time? Oh yes, uh, almost every week. And, and, and by the way, we had no uh, uh, medics on the hill, not with the U.S. forces and not with the Ethiopians. So when someone got hit, we didn't even have a litter to carry them down and we'd have to take them that mile and a half back to the line and, and I would make arrangements to have the helicopter come in uh, through my Air Force ability to contact the Air Force. Uh, and so they'd be waiting. But the problem with that was that it was nighttime and there were typically Chinese uh, uh, patrols out, and they're armed to the teeth with burp guns, and uh, a burp gun, by the way, makes a slapping sound. It's very distinct, you can tell. In fact, one of the GIs said to me, the first time I heard it, he said to me, guess what? That's Joe Chink, and he's playing the burp gun boogie. I never forgot that, <laughs> but uh, it's very distinct. So, so you had the risk, and what you had to do was take the booby traps off the perimeter defense on the outpost, and then we tie up our shirts. Uh, we had extra shirts with us. Uh, we'd tie them up and make a sling out of them, and we'd put the wounded guy into those uh, slings. And when I was with the uh, Ethiopians, uh, there was a bunker next to the point. The very next bunker was probably 20 yards away from me. Uh, and this, uh, this Ethiopian got hit by an incoming artillery round. And apparently he heard it coming. And by the way, you can hear them coming. They sound like a freight train coming and they scream sometimes when the ring gets caught and it's not rotating properly. It's a screaming incoming and it just gives you a, a chill like you've never had in your life. And uh, so anyway, it, it, uh, he screamed after this round went off in his bunker. And so I ran over because he was screaming like, like I never heard a man uh, scream that way. And I ran in and I stepped on him. It was pitch black, of course, I couldn't see, but he was lying on the, on the ground. I stepped on him and it turns out, and this is my assessment, I'm not sure, but I think the incoming round hit the aperture of his bunker and the aperture is uh, the space where you look out and, and you fire from and so on. And it hit the aperture and then must have bounced up to the ceiling of the bunker and then ricocheted down and he was lying on the, on the ground knowing it was coming. And so it hit him in the buttocks and his back. He was in complete misery. And so I ran to the uh, uh, lieutenant that was there and I said look your man he's hurt we got to get him out of here we got to get him off the hill he's in bad shape and lieutenant says no nobody nobody leaves you were asking me take the booby traps off and uh, the enemy is here we're not going I said you have to and I spent another 10 minutes and I finally convinced him to let me take five of his men and me. And I had to call ahead to get the booby traps off the line. And 
there were uh, booby traps ordered by the captain, and that was one thing. So when I called back, they would take them off, knowing we we're coming in with a wounded guy. And, and again, how, how much time in the dark would it take to get this wounded man to the headquarters? Oh, hour and a half or more. Uh, and, and the sad thing was, uh, I, I was generally the point man, uh, and, and I would be carrying or whatever, uh, depending on how many of us there were. Uh, but in this instance, I'd like to just finish that. Uh, we dropped him several times because the trail was only two feet wide in places. And when rounds came in and blew that away, you couldn't tell. So if you're scared and you're running, and we were all scared to death, uh, and you're running and you're trying to make it from A to B, and there were places where you'd suddenly just all go down, lie down, and, and uh, the Chinese would uh, uh, spray the trail with the machine gun fire. And you just lay there and, and hope they would miss you. And, and then it would stop and you'd get up and you'd run. Well, in this instance, this Ethiopian, uh, one of the most uh, extreme events of my life, we dropped him. And he said in English that I didn't even know he could speak, but in, in kind of broken English, he said, Corporal Don, shoot me. Mm. Broke my heart. And you, were you the only American with this group at this point in time? Yes, yeah. So the others around you, you thought, couldn't speak English? That's right. So what did you do? Hand signals, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. I had uh, two or three uh, varied uh, Ethiopians that were so interested in what I was doing. And they'd see me on the radio, uh, talking on the radio, and uh, uh, calling in uh, uh, counterfire on, on the enemy. And uh, they would sit there with their legs crossed and so on. And uh, they'd smile and they'd laugh and oh, they thought it was wonderful, you know? And they, they obviously were saying to each other, did you see that? Because they were making the gestures with their hands, and, you know? And uh, I was their television, so to speak. I certainly was their entertainment, you know? But... Uh, now getting back to the Ethiopian, did you get him Yes. Did he survive? No. He did not survive. No, I was told, that, and this was probably a, a week or ten days later, I was told by one of their lieutenants that the whirlybird came. That's a term of art that we called the helicopters. They were the whirlybird. And uh, they strapped him to the whirlybird, and he was alive. And when they landed, back at a, believe it or not, MASH hospital. And those were re real hospitals, mm -hmm. uh, like the show says. But uh, uh, by that time, he was dead when, uh, when they landed. Did you ever feel that your time was, it was inevitable that you, you could be next? Yes. Were so, you ever injured? Yes. In Tell us about that. All right. Uh, but to get to your first point, I felt every day that I was in, in Korea on the line, on patrol, or on patrol, or on the outpost, I felt every day that I was never going to make it back home. And I was frightened to death. One thing I learned is that mere fear will not stop you from doing your job. And so I did my job, but I was frightened. And I always thought I was going to get hit, but not today. I had a lot of faith. I happened to be a Catholic. I had a missile 
in my pocket at all times. And uh, from time to time, I used to read it. And it gave me uh, great, great confidence that not today I wouldn't get hit. On the day when I did, uh, we were coming off the hill, off the outpost, that is to say, and they were changing divisions for that particular area. And so the platoon was coming up, and the Ethiopian platoon was leaving, and the Chinese threw in everything they could on the outpost and on the battalion front. And uh, I read later, because I had access to the periodic intelligence reports as a member of that group, and I used to read them. And I read later that the official count of incoming rounds that day on the battalion front was 1,500 incoming rounds. Uh, so I was in the, the uh, point bunker, and uh, I was doing counterfire. And uh, suddenly, uh, there were uh, two, as I told you, two Ethiopians were sitting there watching me do this because they weren't. It wasn't their time to, to leave to go, but so they were there watching me do do this. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, there was a round, just oh, 50 meters short of the bunker. Then came a round, went over us, and. Uh, it hit maybe 30 meters past us uh, on the top of the hill, and nobody was up on the top of the hill, so nobody got hurt with that. But uh, I knew if we one is short and the next one's long, the odds are the next one is going to be a direct hit. And so I signaled by hand the two Ethiopians down, and they got down, and sure enough, I could hear the round coming, boom, right at us. I dove on top of the two Ethiopians, and it was a direct hit on the bunker. And when I went down, I, I went like that. And so my face and my ear, my right ear, were exposed. And uh, the round actually burnt my face it didn't scar me permanently, but it gave me a, a double punctured eardrum. And I went back to the rear uh, because th they changed uh, divisions. I believe it was the second division took over for us. And they moved us then over to uh, Kumwa, as I had mentioned earlier. And so uh, we uh, went. Uh, when we got to the, when I got to the rear, my turn to leave uh, the hill, I went to the aid station, and they had a doctor there, and he was something else. He was a little chubby guy, short, and uh, he was almost as fat as he was tall, and he was very, he was jolly, you know, and it, 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 when I went in, he said, hey, soldier, what's your problem? You know, I said, well, incoming round, and I explained it. He said, oh, oh, guess what? You just won yourself the Purple Heart. And uh, my wrist and my arm was cut from the uh, debris that fell and so on. So I was very fortunate. And uh, he bandaged up my arm and put, <laughs> I can't believe this, but he put salve uh, like a grease on my face. And uh, of course, it all blistered and so on. Uh, and and uh, then I was about to leave. Before you left, tell us, did you feel that the quality of medical care that you received was good? No, I thought that was very poor. Mm -hmm. uh, my face was burnt, my ear I couldn't hear out of, and uh, he never looked in my ear at all. 
And when he finished uh, examining me and bandaging my arm and my wrist, he uh, uh, said, before you leave, there's one thing you have to have, soldier. I said, what's that? He said, have you got your cup with you? And I did. It was always hooked to my belt. And uh, I said, yes. He said, join me. And he pulled out a bottle of bourbon. And he poured us each easily a double in mine. And we drank it down. And, and I, I thought it was funny at the time. But, uh, uh, you know, it just didn't seem like good medical treatment to answer your question. How long were you in the rear before you, did you go back after that? How long was I wanted? In the rear after you were injured? Oh, uh, we moved probably the next day to Kumwa. And so uh, I, uh, uh, at that point, I was not on an outpost. And uh, they uh, wanted my skills as a forward observer. Now, the way that happened, that sergeant I talked about earlier, he said to me, let me ask you a question, Don. Can you read a map? And of course, we had had a map reading class. Mm -hmm. and that's why I thought the training was so good. I said, yes, I can read a map. And he said, how do you do it? And I said, well, you look at the grid. That's the square on, drawn on the map. And uh, you uh, divide it into tenths, and you read right and up. Therefore, in, in my case, uh, the grid that we dealt with was CT. Charlie Tear, we called it. And so I would say the coordinates are CT, seven, six. So the seven was along the line there, and the six was up here. And seven, six gave it to them, and the uh, artillery rounds would be fired. And I would adjust them. I'd say add 15 meters, I meant. Or I'd say 20 right, and they'd move it over to the right. So. That's the essence of what being an FO is all about. And uh, I had no problem with that at all. How long were you in Korea? I was in Korea a total of nine and a half months. During that time period, did you have any kind of rest, R&R, &R, so to speak, rest? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, they froze uh, rotation in December of uh, 52. The Army froze rotation. And uh, myself and that friend of mine that I told you about, uh, we put our names in for R&R. &R. We had never gone. And that meant we were on the top of the list because we were in our uh, middle of our eighth month or so there. So we were the top ones on, on the list. And so, yes, we went to Japan. We, we flew on a... a KC-135, I think it was. They called it the flying boxcar. And an experience there, we had to wear parachutes. None of us had any training whatsoever with a parachute. But there wasn't any doubt in my mind, uh, or anybody's on the airplane, we would have jumped if we had to. And how long a period of time did you get to spend in Japan on rest? Uh, five days. And uh, we stayed at an American uh, hotel. And uh, we uh, uh, went to, uh, uh, Yo uh, well, we landed in Yokohama, Atami Air Base, it's called, in Yokohama. And we went from there to uh, Kyoto, Japan, which is uh, uh, the center of uh, their Buddhist uh, uh, temples and what have you. And, and uh, I even played nine holes of golf there. I was going to ask you about that. Could you enjoy yourself? It sounds 
like, how, how were you emotionally? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, and this is the truth, we drank a bit, mm -hmm. quite a bit. And my friend uh, uh, was from New York City, and I, I, I drank, so uh, I had tended bar and all that sort of thing. And uh, so needless to say, I felt my drinks pretty, pretty well. Uh, first day, and uh, this this friend he said, uh, uh, "Gee, he was looking at the drink menu, and of course he didn't drink." And what I liked about him was he was a wrestler in college, and I thought, "Well, he's my buddy; he's going to take care of me if anything happens." So I didn't worry about it. And he was reading the menu uh, of the drinks, and he said. Uh, Say, Don, look what that says. Manhattan. I wonder what that is. And I said, what do you mean? And uh, he said, well, I, I'd like to try it. I said, I said to the bartender, he wants a Manhattan. And the bartender, Japanese guy, says, me no makey. I said, OK, I makey. So I got behind the bar. I made him his Manhattan. And he took it, and was a very powerful drink, as you know. And he took it and sipped it, and said, oh, gee, that tastes good. Down it went. <laughs> Put his glass down, he said, I think I could have another. So needless to say, he joined me for the rest of our trip. We, we uh, went to Kyoto. I played golf there, nine holes. Female caddy that I never had in, in the States. And uh, anyway, we uh, were in this bar uh, upstairs in, in some dingy little bar. And uh, it was, it was uh, mobbed with GIs. And uh, so we were drinking quite a bit, and, and I had to go to the men's room. And I got up and left, but I left my money on the table. And it was yen, uh, you know, uh, 300 and some to the dollar at that time. And I came back, and my money's gone. And there's my friend sitting there. And I said, what happened to my money? He says, I don't know. <laughs> He was still drinking Manhattans. <laughs> and so uh, I said, well, what happened to them? And he said, oh, the girls uh, took it. I said, what girls? He said, well, I, when you left, the girls, the girls came. Because he and I avoided the girls, and there were plenty of them around. Uh, I had promised my mother I wouldn't fool around that way, and I didn't. But I drank. And so anyway, uh, I guess I got pretty loud about it. And the next thing you know, a Japanese uh, manager came over. What's your problem? I said, the girls took my money. He said, no girls here. And you look around, and it was full of girls. The whole, I said, what are you, kidding me? Of course. He says, G.I., you come with me. We go outside, we talk. I said, no way. And uh, my friend was just sitting there, totally out of it. And so uh, uh, this guy grabbed my shirt, and he started to pull me toward the door. And so I smacked him, and I knocked him down. Now, uh, uh, those are small people. I don't mean hooray for me. but uh, So when I hit him, down he went. and. The next thing you know, some GI yelled, fight. You could hear it all over the place. And so every GI in the place, it seemed, stood up and smacked every Japanese person he could see. They came out of the woodwork. I don't know where they all came from. And I backed up against the wall, sort of in a corner. They couldn't get behind me. And I was just throwing them, literally, off to the side, through the bamboo, wrecking the joint. And finally, 
somebody hit me with a club, and it was an MP, and I didn't know that, and I smacked him, and he went down. It was just a lucky punch. I'm not a fighter. I'm not a good one, but I did catch him, and down he went, and suddenly two guys grabbed me, and they put me head down and out the door and into a car. They threw me into a car. And they put their feet on me and held me down. And I said, What's going, what the hell is going on? Who are you? And it turns out they were two Marines who were assigned to uh, the base there. And they were sorry that they weren't in Korea. And so what they did, they told me later, was to uh, watch out for GIs and sort of take care of them. And so they had me in the car and they decided we ought to go get something to eat, which was good. They didn't know I had a buddy there. Mm -hmm. And so off we went. I don't know where we were. We ate and suddenly I said, hey, I got to get my buddy. They said, oh, I said, look, we're going back tomorrow. And uh, they said, no, no, you can't go back there. And they, you know, yeah, you started that and all that. I said, well, we got to go. So I finally convinced them. Back we went. They, they knew how to get there. And uh, anyway, uh, when I got there, there was my friend sitting under what looked like the classic naked light bulb <laughs> over his head. And he's sitting there. Waiting for you. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, I walk up to the table. And he says, hey, Don. Where the hell have you been? I said, it's a long story. Sure. He said, you know, there was a fight. <laughs> so I, you were five days. Yes. And then you went back. Did you go back to the front after that? Yes. As a For matter of fact, how much longer? We went uh, to, uh, let me think a minute here, uh, months uh, uh, longer. Uh, I actually uh, rotated uh, June 4th or so of the next year. And, uh, uh, but anyway, we, uh, we went back on December 24th, Christmas Eve. And the priest uh, came up to the front. We were at the front at that time. And uh, he said mass using a jeep as the altar and he'd lay out the cloths and so on. And it was really very, very moving. But uh, uh, I went from there uh, uh, back to, the, uh, to an outpost. It was a different outpost. But they were using me primarily as an FO at that time. Forward and, observer. Yes. And, uh, so when you mentioned being rotated out, so from December to June you were at another outpost and again saw almost daily interaction with uh, yes. the enemy. Yes. Oh, oh, yes, indeed. But uh, anyway, we, uh, uh, it was near the end of my time when uh, we took Triangle Hill and uh, there were three regiments in the 7th Division, if I can remember. The first one was the 17th Regiment. Uh, the second one, to go up Triangle Hill, the second one was uh, the 31st Regiment. And then the third one was my regiment, the 32nd uh, Regiment. And uh, so we went up uh, triangle on the uh, third day um, and as I think I mentioned there were 1500 casualties in three days the army history book which I researched when I wrote my journal says that Triangle Hill was the third highest uh, casualty loss of the Korean War and uh, if I may develop this a little bit, uh, it was shocking, uh, uh, to say the least. The pungent smell of uh, uh, dead bodies and the, uh, uh, the air was just full of smoke 
from all the rounds that were being fired. Uh, but they used me again as an FO and a spotter, if you will, for where, where was the enemy coming from. And they were coming from that hill I mentioned before, 1052. It turns out later they had room for a battalion of Chinese under the top of that hill. And that's where the enemy was coming from, across Sniper's Ridge, past Jane Russell, to uh, Hill 598, which was Triangle Hill. And they were coming across that ridge, and my job was to hit them with counterfire as they did that. And, and we did that uh, for three days. And uh, when we uh, uh, were replaced by what I believe to be the second division. I say it that way because they didn't have any identification on them uh, that would tell you who they were, but I just got the sense from talking to a couple of them that they were second division types. And uh, anyway, so we, we uh, pulled off and we got back to the rear. And when I say the rear, I mean way back. Uh, <coughs> six, eight miles from the front, and we set up battalion headquarters there. But there was a, a hill, and the lieutenant colonel in charge of the whole battalion at that time called me in, and he said, Alton, I've got a special assignment for you. And I said, uh, what's that, sir? He said, I want you to go over and look over that hill and see who you can identify of the unidentified dead bodies, the GIs. And uh, I said, yes, sir. And the reason he chose me was because of my outpost experience. I had met every man in every uh, company, every platoon for the whole battalion. So. In that process, I tentatively identified maybe 20 dead Americans. Well, Americans and uh, uh, some Koreans and uh, at least one uh, Ethiopian. Uh, and, and my identifications were very tentative. Problem was, we all had dog tags. We used to tape them together when we were on patrol because they made noise. And uh, uh, so the GIs, were, they were a peculiar bunch. They used to hide all their money on the, somewhere on the line or in their living bunker before we were taking Triangle, for example. The only problem was some of them even took their dog tags off. Some of the dog tags got blown off when they got hit. And so uh, there were, it was hard you know, to, to identify them. And uh, the things that I remember was that uh, a peculiar, uh, they're lying face down and, and they're dead and their wristwatch is shattered. So you could tell what time it was when they got hit. Uh, it, it was that kind of a thing that hit me. And I did that and uh, worked with a graves registration guy, GRS they called it, Graves Registration Service. And uh, it bothered me immensely when I got back to the States how, uh, how cruel I must have been because I did that and when I finished I went down back further in the rear uh, in a Jeep with a guy, a driver, and uh, got a hot meal. And I remember the hot meal that I hadn't had in months because I was eating sea rations. Uh, we had Swedish meatballs. It was one of the best meals I ever had in my life. Yeah. Um. 
talk about some of your commendations because your story is so remarkable and you did mention you got the bronze medal. Well, uh, uh, let, me, let me address that because uh, I, I did get the uh, Korean uh, theater identification uh, ribbons, you know, the, uh, but, uh, uh, and I also had three battle stars on that uh, because of my time on or in front of the line. But um, when I was leaving the outfit on a two and a half ton truck, we call them deuce and a halves, uh, I was on the deuce and a half and the sergeant uh, in, in charge of uh, S1, S1 was personnel matters, and that master sergeant came running out and he says, hey, oh, guess what? You're in for the Bronze Star for valor. And I said, wow, you know, uh, that's, uh, there's the Bronze Star, the Silver Star, and the Medal of Honor, <laughs> you know, in that, that order. So I thought, gee whiz, that's, that's awesome. And I am leaving. I couldn't believe I was leaving, but I was. It turns out uh, the doctor had said, you're in for the Purple Heart. The sergeant said I was in for the Bronze Star. I never got the Purple Heart. I never got the Bronze Star. However, I wrote to St. Louis uh, headquarters when I was a civilian back, back here in the States. And uh, I wrote to them and asked why I never got those medals. And uh, they wrote me back. And they said, Mr. Rolton, Due to a fire that we had in St. Louis, a significant number of records of Korean veterans were destroyed. Consequently, we have no evidence whatsoever that you were in the United States Army. That was that. At what rank were you discharged? Uh, I uh, was a uh, staff sergeant, and uh, uh, when I uh, got uh, back to the rear in, uh, in Korea, uh, before we went over to Triangle, they made me battalion intelligence sergeant, which was a slot for a master sergeant. and. Uh, However, the Army froze rank, and so I was then a staff sergeant, and that's what I got discharged uh, from Washington. What, what was it like for you knowing you were coming home? Well, uh, I couldn't believe it. And uh, I talked about fear before, and I think it's healthy to talk about. Uh, I had it from the day I landed in Pusan, uh, the fear in the pit of my stomach. I had that, I believe, for at least a year after I got home. Uh, and one thing about the Korean War, we didn't talk about it. Uh, our brothers, older brothers, uh, and at that time they had no women being drafted or whatever, so when I say men, that's the way it was. But our older brothers had been in World War II. They had told all their combat stories to each other ad nauseum at the bars that we'd go to. And they didn't want to hear mine. And I didn't want to tell them either. So that worked out all right. But I can honestly say I had fear in my belly for at least a year. Did you join any units of the military reserve or any veterans organizations? Uh, no. 
I, uh, I didn't. However, uh, I, I am a member of the American Legion at this time. When I, uh, uh, it happens that I became a lawyer and uh, after I became a lawyer, I also became a, an assistant district attorney for three years, 1972 to 75. And I, I tried uh, uh, in their records some 2,500 uh, criminal cases. Well, one of my courts was Natick. Uh, there are 12 district courts in Middlesex County. I was assigned Natick, Marlboro, and uh, one other that I, at the moment, can't even think of. But uh, in that process, the, uh, uh, I was fairly well known, certainly among police officers and, uh, oh, Framingham is where I was assigned as well. And uh, so anyway, uh, I uh, uh, was asked by the Legion, by someone in the Legion, if I would come and address them in terms of similar to this, uh, my combat time and so on, which I did. And in so doing, I uh, had done the research, uh, which appears on the top of my poem, uh, about how many uh, Americans were killed and how many missing and so on. And, and I did, did that uh, uh, for purposes of my speech to the Legion. It turns out on the Sunday morning, that was Saturday night, Sunday morning, I was sitting in my family room uh, having a cup of coffee or something, and I looked out in the yard and there was a fog, a low ground fog that I had never seen before and I haven't seen it since. But that's what we had almost every morning in Korea was that low ground fog over the extinct uh, rice paddies. And it impressed me and I had all those uh, details in my mind from my speech the night before and I just took a blank piece of paper and I wrote that poem. Before we get to the poem, mm -hmm. let's get back a minute to, um, you mentioned you became a lawyer. Yes. Did you use the GI Bill to yes, help indeed. you with, with your education? Yes, uh, my brother and I both came uh, to Boston uh, at my mother's insistence she was an old Irish uh, mother who said, you bums, get out and do something with yourself. And did you go to school in Boston? <laughs> yes. Where did you go to school? We went to uh, Boston University. And I had had auto mechanics in high school. And uh, my brother took a business course, but neither of us did very well in our grades. Anyway, BU said, uh, here's a test. If you can pass this test, we'll let you enter the school. We took the test, both of us. We both passed the test. And so we came to Boston, and uh, uh, we had two years of general education in the College of General Education. From there, they said, if you make the dean's list, we'll transfer you as a junior into the business school. And so they did, and uh, we made the dean's list. Uh, we both made it the same semester, same time, and, and transferred over, and uh, we got our uh, BS in business administration, and uh, that was the extent of my study at BU. After I was married seven years or so, I said to my wife, I have the damnedest urge to uh, uh, become a lawyer. I had associated with lawyers and caddied for them when I was nine years old. And uh, I just had the fire in the belly to do that. And when, where did you go to law school? So I went to Suffolk Law School, um, 
my wife said, okay, you can, uh, you know, go to law school, but you'll have to pay your own way. And so I took a job at Brayburn Country Club, uh, tending bar, in addition to my full-time job at General Dynamics as a uh, contracts negotiator. So uh, I was with them for about seven years. And uh, anyway, I picked up the, uh, the law degree. When you came home after the fact, did you attend any reunions of your old unit or get together with old friends? No. As a matter of fact, I, I never even talked about it. Some of my children, um, of the four of them, didn't even know I was in the Army. I just never talked about it. I know earlier in this interview you mentioned um, the self-sufficiency yes. that the Army taught you. How important do you think serving in the military was and how do you feel it affected your life? Well, I think it uh, engendered great confidence in me uh, and in my self-sufficiency, a sense that I could I could do anything and succeed. Uh, and that, and uh, I notice they say something like that in some of the ads they run for the Army, that uh, the individual is the Army. They, they clearly give you that sense. You've mentioned a few uh, humorous experiences in, in spite of all of the horror that you saw, one being the bar scene with your friend. Any other memorable experiences or characters that you'd like to just briefly mention? Well, um, there are about two that occurred. Uh, one was a fellow from uh, Fox Company, F Company, uh, of the uh, 3rd Battalion. Uh, they sent him out, uh, they sent his platoon out to the outpost, and uh, his name was Beans. And I never heard what his correct name was, but Beans was from Arkansas, and he had a uh, fascination with me on, uh, this is on the outpost only, uh, watching me do, just like the Ethiopians uh, later, uh, watching me do my job. And uh, so he and I got to be good friends. I'd almost say dear friends. And, uh, but his name was Beans. And when he was off duty, so to speak, because they used to have like two on and four off 24 hours a day on the outpost, I had a schedule that I would set for myself. Sometimes I didn't sleep for two days around the clock. But uh, anyway, he, he uh, liked to come up and sit with me and uh, watch me do it. So uh, he was on his way up. And the way they had the, the front line structured, they had searchlights, huge searchlights. I never saw them up close, but I could see them from where I was. They'd shine them on the outpost. What a mixed blessing that was, uh, because the trenches only came up to a little above your waist. And there you are, highlighted, going from A to B. Snipers, they had a field day shooting at, at us when we moved around. And uh, it, uh, I mean, I would have given a million dollars to blow up those searchlights and, and uh, give us a break. Uh, but anyway, so Beans was coming up to the point to watch me, I guess. And I could hear, it's, it's very calm, very still on the outpost. You don't make any noise. You don't let anybody know you're there. You don't let them know you're awake if you, and so on. And so it was very uh, eerie, calm. And uh, all of a sudden, you hear this guy shout, Oh, who goes there? And this voice shouts back, 
It's me, Beans. I ain't lying. <laughs> and with that, and I don't mean to be vulgar, but he let a couple of things go <laughs> that you could hear back in Seoul. <laughs> Perhaps why he was given the nickname. He, oh, there's no question that sure. that was why. Sure. And uh, the whole hill laughed. It was so funny. But, uh, uh, yeah, I loved him. He was, he was just the greatest guy. And it turns out that uh, he got killed. Uh, I found out when his platoon ro rotated back up, uh, he was on patrol. And as luck would have it, he was right off the outpost on the valley floor when the uh, chinks, we called them, blew him away. And that's what they told me. You had mentioned earlier about your journal that you have put together similar to what you've told us today. But you also mentioned two other things that I thought we could wrap up today with. And sure. one is the poem that you mentioned. Do you want to talk, uh, take yes. the poem and... Um, yes, I would like to. Um, I have these bad hands. Here it is. Yeah, this is my poem. Uh, I'll show that if you wish. Just for the record. Uh, but that's the poem that I described uh, earlier. If I may, I'd like to read the top of it. These are the statistics of the Korean War. Uh, and they were official statistics that I researched. And I understand that they've changed somewhat. They don't, uh, they don't agree with 54,000. The current number is something more in the order of 30-some thousand killed in Korea. But in any case, uh, uh, my research said there were 54,236 dead, 103,000 wounded, 8,177 missing in action, 7,000 prisoners of war, 3,450 POWs returned to the United States alive, 51% died in prison camps, and 389 POWs were unaccounted for. To me, that's those are powerful numbers. In any case, I would like to read the poem at this time, if I may. I uh, called the poem, I titled the poem, In Remembrance of Korea, Land of the Morning Calm. Um, I said before, this poem has a life of its own. And it turns out that when I read this poem at a later meeting at the Legion, uh, they asked for a copy and they published it. Uh, I had copyrighted it, but they published it in uh, uh, the uh, Legion magazine. And I finally got a letter from uh, the Battle Monuments Commission in Washington, a letter signed by the director, a colonel, uh, saying that he had read the poem in the, the uh, Legion magazine and uh, wondered if I would agree that they could take this poem and consider it for use, possible use, on the National uh, Korean War Monument. And I, of course, sent him back a letter saying that I would be honored. Right. And so it turns out um, that nothing happened. And I was at the dedication of that uh, memorial. And uh, it's not there, of course. And about two and a half or maybe three years ago, I got another letter from the Battle Monuments Commission from the director 
now, and he was a full colonel, and he said he had just taken over as director, and that uh, in looking over the papers in the file, he found this poem, and uh, he said, which regrettably, these are his words, which regrettably was not used on the monument. And uh, he said, I assume you still agree with your permission for such use. And I wrote him back and said, of course, and that I was flattered. Let's so, hear the poem. I, I've, I've read it. It's just beautiful. Could well, you? Uh, yes. If Please. I may, I, I'll uh, read this. I say, if I listen closely, I can hear them although they've been a long time gone. Their voices are steady and soulful, and in my memory, they blend like in song. They paid the great price for their strong acts of will. You know what I speak of if you've been on or taken a hill. The training prepared us, and the cadre were pleased, for they taught us the basics of sight, breathe and squeeze. Yes, they taught us the basics of sight, breathe and squeeze. When you're on an outpost or right at the front, keeping warm, dry and well fed is a challenging stunt. And at times it is awesome, quote, bombs bursting in air, coming so close you're afraid, you despair. you pick up your rifle and sight, breathe, and squeeze. Was that one of the enemy who fell to his knees? Now look to the left flank and then to the right. With taps from their bugles, you'll fight through the night. And on toward the morning, with cold, sweaty palms, you see fog rolling in in the land's morning calm. So you check for your buddies, and with panic you're seized, for the enemy took some by sight, breathe, and squeeze. Yes, the enemy took some by sight, breathe, and squeeze. Lest their loss overcomes you, it's a good time to pray, as he in his wisdom grants you one more day to act for the fallen and their brave deeds enhance and say thanks to God Almighty for this special chance. If we who live in freedom remember that central thought, we'll keep faith with lost brothers. So they did not die for naught. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful poem. And as we finish, I do want to note also you mentioned the congressional record that yes. Senator Kennedy submitted and presented to you. And Donald Olton, I want to thank you for a, a wonderful remembrance. I know it's difficult, but we appreciate what you did for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.